Good afternoon. Welcome to EduSet Network. Friend, as you know, we have uh, we are going to discuss today a very important topic: post-colonialism. Post-colonialism is generally meant the after, say, in the context of India when the uh, India got independence from the this. Uh, so uh, this is the era after 47 is uh, one way to say that post-colonial era. And before that, similarly, if, uh, in other countries, when they got independent, we can say the post-colonial era. So the point here arise here, the thinking after the independence got changed or the same, what were the Western thinker would think about the culture and thought process uh, still remains uh, same. We'll try to understand these aspects. What is the thinking process in post-colonial era? And uh, what kind of new research and what kind of new thinking has come out about the culture and thought process? And for discussion on this very topic, we have in the studio a renowned political science thinker, Dr. M. N. Thakur. He teaches uh, uh, political science in Center for Political, uh, political Science in Jawaharlal Nehru University, a premier institution of the country. And he has also authored book and uh, frequently contributes the article on political and social issues in different newspapers and uh, journals. So on your behalf, I welcome Dr. M. N. Thakur for Edusat lecture on this very topic, post-colonial society, thinking in the post-colonial society. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Amrind. Uh, what I'm going to do today is I'll try to talk about the thinking process in the post-colonial society and how far we have got autonomy from the colonial masters. That is the issue that troubles a lot of people these days. The question that generally is being raised is that, is it that we are thinking the way the colonial masters have thought about us? I mean to say that is it that we are borrowing their approach to our society and we are thinking as if that is our approach. And we think about ourselves not as we are constituted ourselves, but as they have thought about us. So that is the issue. I think this is a very genuine issue and a very big, big issue too, because if you take every human being as reflexive being, uh, by reflexive, reflexive being I mean the human beings are creative thinking beings and in every situation, they do reflect on their being in the world, about themselves, about their relation with the nature, about their relation with other human beings. If every human being is capable of doing that, then in every part of the world, human beings must have done certain kind of re reflexive thinking. They must have produced certain kind of ideas about themselves, about their relation with other human beings and about their relation with the nature. And that one can call the collective consciousness of that society. And every society must have developed theories to understand themselves. Every society <coughs> I think is also an epistemic society means that they have an organizing principle of their own society. They think about themselves under the limits of the organizing principles of their own society. The meanings of their engagement with each other, their engagement with nature must have been derived under the parameters of the epistemic frame that they, they create for themselves. If every society is like that everywhere in the world, then the question does arise what happened to these societies when the colonial masters came to these societies. Say India was colonized by Britain. So what happened in that period? We all know that in that period they appropriated a lot of surplus from this area. And that is why they, we are called colonies. Colonies means that they controlled our geographical area and appropriated 
natural resources and human resources from here to develop the economy of their own. So, the British industrial development was funded by and fed by the Indian resources that is why we were colonies. So, we are aware of this aspect of colonialism. We are also aware of the political aspect of colonialism that they develop a political mechanism to control us. They developed certain kind of state system so that our economy could remain oriented toward their interest, their benefit. And we fought against that, we fought against colonial power, we got independence and we have our own political system now. We do think that we have control on our economy also. I am not sure how much control we do have as you know that there is a World Bank, IMF and a global capital and the and world forums for economy and all and there is a new colonial exploitation of the economy that Andre Gundre Frank and many others have mentioned that how the surplus of these countries are still going out despite the end of colonialism. We have an independent political state which we think we, we men and they are run by us as we represent ourselves in that, but I am not sure to what extent they actually are independent, to what extent they take independent decisions about everything. So, this much we can understand, but the real question today is how far we are independent in the thought process, how far the post colonial societies are free from the domination of the colonial world in the arena of thinking. I think this is a major question that is troubling a lot of people. What actually happened when they colonized us? They, don't, they not only colonized our economy and polity, they in fact mainly colonized us at the level of the idea. The argument was that during the colonial period or during the colonization, the argument that they tried to project was that these cultures, these societies were inferior societies. They did not have knowledge, they were more religious, underdeveloped, backward and it was white man's burden to civilize them. So, they, they came here to civilize these societies and whatever knowledge these societies generated, whatever knowledge that was available here with them through which they were understanding themselves and through which they were understanding the world those knowledge systems the colonial power suggested were out of date, out not only out of date, but also useless. They were not scientific. So, the new knowledge system they tried to introduce here a scientific knowledge system and we gradually accepted that as superior knowledge system because they were given by the masters. So, we enter into master slave relationship, a master slave relationship where we thought that the master understands himself and us both and what we actually want to do or what we can do, what is our capacity, everything can be understood by the master properly. So, what happened in that period that lot of perspectives were developed or one can say with this perspective they tried to understand the other culture and while understanding the other culture they developed a kind of framework and that framework got transmitted to the people in the colonial world. And gradually we also started looking at ourselves with the help of that perspective. Now, this is the question that if we started to understand the world, understand ourselves with the help of the perspective that the colonial master gave us then can we claim that we are independent? Can we claim that we are free from the colonial master? Or is it that we actually carry that notion so much in our head that despite the fact that we have become free from the colonial master in the realm of politics and the realm of economy, we are not free in the realm of 
culture not free in the realm of ideas. Now, on this issue, a very significant debate has taken place, and it is started with one can say a first generation of freedom fighters or second generation of freedom fighters, whatever you like to call them, those who were theorizing during the colonial period itself. French Fanon was one of them. One can even consider Gandhi as one of them who just said that we have to get rid of the ideas of the colonialism, get rid of the perspective that colonialism has given to us. Arbindo was one of them. Fanon particularly made very significant points. In Algeria, he was suggesting the blacks that when you try to become white and you try to paint your face to become white, what actually you become is much more black than white. But now, not only that you can be located as black who is trying to become white, but also that in your psyche, you have accepted that to be white is to be superior. Now, when we try to borrow these things from our master, when we try to borrow these things and try to look like them, then what happens is that we acknowledge their superiority. And we, if, if we acknowledge their superiority, then we undermine all knowledge systems and culture and everything that was given to us. We are assuming that western culture is superior and we all have to follow the western culture. That is the basic assumption behind this. Now, after Feno, this thing was picked up by, by a very famous author called Edward Said, who talked in his book Orientalism and proposed a thesis that how actually one can call their perspective as orientalist perspective. The orientalist who thought of the orient in a very particular way and being very different from the occident. So, east is so different from the west and the east has a particular kind of notion what does east mean. So, they, they, different, they created an other and developed an understanding of the other and then that understanding of the other was inherited by or adopted by the colonial subject also. So, the colonial subject gradually started understanding themselves about their relationships, about their society with the help of the perspective of the master. Then there are more people in this in this fray, you have Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak, you have Deepesh Chattopadhyay. These people have worked on different dimensions of this and particularly the borrowing from Foucault, Gayatri Chakravarti argues about the power relationship, the relation between knowledge and the power, that how the knowledge that they claim as knowledge and they expunged all the knowledges existing in the domain of knowledge existing in the third world and that particular knowledge that they brought from there as a colonial uh, master that knowledge became very powerful and that knowledge constituted power relationships in colonial societies. And it is very easy to say the modern doctors the way they behave in India all the modern knowledge holders the way they treat the people that shows very simply that how there is a power relationship in of the knowledge and knowledge has a more subtle power relationship in society. So, these societies actually what the way we are conceptualizing ourselves, the way we are thinking of ourselves, the way we are planning our, our life, the way we are, we are having the moral dilemmas, everything they are saying is constituted by the perspective which is called orientalism. Now, this is an interesting argument because we see if we look at our universities, if you look at our intellectuals, if you look at the way they are analyzing Indian society, the subjects, the, the kind of the kind of structure of the university system itself, the kind of language that we are using, everything seems to be borrowed from the West. And very interesting thing, very interesting point that has been made by somebody called uh, S. N. Balgangadhar that in fact what has happened is that these borrowed terms have a very different meaning for the European world and the Indian society. 
take for instance religion. Now, religion as a concept Bal Gangadhar thinks does not exist in India, it never existed in India. The components of religion, the parameters of religion, the notion of religion that the West has is extremely different than what we understand by religion. You never had something called religion in our past society. We had dharma. Dharma is not religion. A lot of people have argued that the notion of dharma is very different compared to the notion of religion. Because religion has, if you look at the, the term religion in the, in the western context, concept, context, they have God as a major component, the notion of God as a major component in religion. They have institutions of religion like church. They talk of one text like Bible and then they talk of morality being driven from the Bible and ultimately from the God. So, all these things constitute religion. If you look at Hinduism or Buddhism or Jainism, the question will emerge can we call them religion? Is Hinduism a religion? But it is difficult to say that Hinduism has a notion of God as the Christianity has the notion of God. Hindu gods are much more symbolic. Hindu gods are one that they are numerous, anybody can become a god, even human beings have been declared god or god men. Initially they become god men, they, they, they are declared god, then you start having their statue and the temples and everything. You have the recent example of Sai Baba how Sai Baba has, has been declared by God, how, has got a place in the temples now. In many of the temples in India, you will find that apart from all other gods and goddesses, Sai Baba's statue is also placed there and a day has been fixed for him. So, people go there and pray for pray, pray him. Now, this is a very, very interesting situation that you have something called religion which is very organized, very structured, very much con very much interested in controlling the society, it controls the, the social relationships, it is it has a very deep relation with the state, the state funds also at times and they, 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 they sometimes are in conflict, sometimes in con confrontation. But if you look at Hindu society, since time immemorial, the state was never controlling religion, neither religion was controlling the state. They had their own domains. And in fact, there was no religion like Christianity in Hinduism, like you never had a kind of a strong institution controlling everything, regulating everything. It was much more a way of life, much more a kind of kind of philosophy. And philosophy also where Actually, the notion of the God does not exist. If you look at six major philosophies of Hinduism, as they call it, none of them have any notion of God. They never derive, they never depend their argument on the existence of God, never draw their arguments from the God's existence. So, for instance, you take Nyai philosophy. Nyai philosophy suggests that it is a philosophy aiming at making human beings free from three kinds of dukkha, dahik, davik and bhatik, the material problem, the problem which you cannot expect from where they are coming, unexpected problems and the problems of thinking and all. So, all kinds of problems are to be solved so that human beings are liberated. Look at the Sankhi philosophy. It suggests that if you are capable of understanding your consciousness fairly well and controlling your consciousness, regulating your consciousness, probably you will be free. Mimansa suggests that you have to study the text and how do you study is important and the meanings have to be derived. So, I do not think anywhere in the philosophical text, you find there is any debate on existence of God and about the Buddhism we all know. 
that Buddha never believed in the existence of God. Buddhism does not have a notion of God. In fact, there is a famous story about Buddhism that when Buddha was going somewhere, somebody asked him, do you think God exists? Buddha said, what do you think? He asked him, what do you think? The fellow replied, I do not think God exists. Buddha said, God does exist. Next time when he, when, he, when he was confronted with the same question, he asked the person and he replied in the same opposite way. And a third time when somebody asked him, he again asked, in, asked him uh, the same question and the fellow said that I do not know whether God exists or not and Buddha said that I also do not know whether God exists or not. So, Ananda asked him what are you doing? Why have you answered in three different ways? What is the motive behind? Buddha replied, look I have put them on the state, same state of mind. Now, they have to look for these things. I, if I say God exists and people have been believing that God exists, then he will start thinking that since Buddha also has said God exists, God must be, must, must be existing. The core idea is that in fact, there is no notion of God like the Christianity has. If that is true, then can we analyze our society by using the concept of religion that has been borrowed that we have borrowed from the West? That is a question raised by Bal Gangadhar. I think it is a valid question. Bal Gangadhar takes another example of law. Is law a concept that was available in our society? Law is a very western concept this is the argument. He says that you know what happened in the west? They have laws have a moral sanction. Laws are respected. Take for example, Socrates. He was punished for breaking the law and he said that unless the law changes, I will not go against the law. I will follow what the law says. So, there is a tremendous respect for law. And of course, the state implements law, but law predates state in a way. In our society, same kind of law do not exist. We do not have respect for the laws made by the state because we do not, we never respected the state as a state was a colonial state, was an exploitative state. The state was never very, very helpful to the people. Consequently, anything that the state would do, we did not like that. We wanted to break away from that. We want to take, we want to break the rules. Take an example, putting on helmet on your head when you are driving is a law in the favor of security and safety of the driver of the bike. But to implement that, we have to use force. We use police to implement that in India. Nowhere in the world where laws have emerged, laws have been deeply rooted in society, this kind of event you can find that things which are necessary for human survival are forcefully implemented. This only shows that probably we do not have much respect for law, law made by the state. But on the other hand, despite the state intervention, you can see that there are social laws and the social laws are so powerful that despite state intervention, they survive. We want to change the social law, but we are unable to change it. What is the reason behind this? The reason behind this is that we have a very different notion of regulating our interpersonal relationships and social relationships. We do not think that our interpersonal relationships can be regulated by law. Now, the, the, the picture is not so neat. We know that since last many decades, we are struggling with what is called the colonial psyche and we are carrying that out because we what happened in the colonialism was that they destroyed our thought process, they destroyed our institutions, 
the colonialism destroyed our basic structure and now what is happening we are confused we do not know what to do. If we drop the idea of religion the large number of research being produced by India Indian scholars will be irrelevant. If we carry the idea of religion in our research then we are unable to capture the phenomenon that we have here. If we are we are carrying the law notion of the law in our society then we will find that we are unable to understand lot of things which, which which is happening in our society and if we drop that then we do not know how shall we run ourselves. Now, this is the dilemma where the postmodern post uh, colonial thinkers are hinting at that look what is happening is that you have abandoned your own knowledge systems, you are abandoned your own institutions, you are abandoned your own social relationship the way you were being the way you constituted yourself. You want to adopt the West, you want to be guided by the Western ideas and you think they are space neutral ideas it is neutral from east or west neutral from colonialism or non colonialism they are ideas per se, but what actually happening is that you are being controlled by by them. You are being completely controlled by them in terms of conceptualizing yourselves and if you conceptualize as a master conceptualizes you then probably you can never get out of it then you are into permanent mode of slavery you are into it. Now, this is an interesting fascinating argument we see this implication of this even in social sciences why do you think social sciences in India have become so irrelevant I mean a lot of people would not agree with me on this, but let me put this point forward that the impact assessment of social science knowledge is being done at the moment in the context of they are being quoted by the scholars the scholars in the west because the most of the journals are being published in the west. We follow their evaluation process of the university system also whether we are good social scientists or bad social scientists is being evaluated by where do we publish. I think there is a need to have a kind of evaluation system impact assessment system in terms of the impact of the knowledge on the public as a whole the people what is the impact of the knowledge on the people how many people are convinced about the knowledge how many people how many people have changed their life because of the knowledge I think we do not have that idea. So, the notion of social science the way we think of social science is the social science of the west which is not relevant for our society is it that our society never had something called social science in any form if you do not want to call it social science do not call it social science, but some way of understanding your own social relationship some way of transforming your social relationship some way of reconceptualizing your social relationships some way of making sense of the actors social actors and the political actors do we had some do we had something did we have something I think that it was there in a very narrative form it was there in a form of narratives and a number of stories and, and, and the and novels and various kinds of literary uh, texts that we have produced these texts are actually another form of social science because they talk about your society they talk about ethics of the society they talk they, they tell you that how you should manage your social affairs. Now, by all standards by the standard of the west by the standard of this post colonial society post colonial by standard of the colonial social science we, we do not have social science then that was not all social science, but the social science developed in the colonial era to control society that we must remember these narratives are not to control society these narratives are to liberate society and therefore, there is a difference what is happening in our universities today that we are carrying with the model of social science which was created for the control of society we are providing in input to the state 
so that people can be controlled. That is our social science. And in that social science is not the social science that was existing in India. And therefore, that social science is unable to connect with the people. Now, you will find that people at the margin, when they do social science, they have raised a question like Gopal Guru, a Dalit, who, when he is talking of the Dalit theory and all, he is raising this question, the experiential epistemology. What happens to my experience? How do we theorize the experience? The marginalized people produce autobiographies, not social science texts. And the autobiographies are transforming the lives of the people. They are powerful texts. They are self-reflexive texts. The community people read that. They start feeling that there was a common factor in the exploitation of the people. And the com people from outside community also read that and they start reflect reflecting on one's own behavior and they start being being apologetic about that. They start being they start thinking to transform oneself. So, the narrative mode of doing social science, social research, uh, talking about a society, if I talk, if I call social science, uh, talking about a society, writing about society, if that is a mode of narratives, probably that becomes much more influential in India. So, these questions are important that whether all these modes of doing, thinking about ourselves, doing social science, be it doing social science or, or thinking through the categories like law, religion, civil society, all these categories we have to reconsider. And we have to reclaim that is the post spirit theory suggesting that we have to reclaim ourselves as an epistemic community. Because when some other culture comes to you with their own epistemology tries to understand you, they cannot understand you fully well. And particularly if they have come with the motive to control you, then they produce a particular kind of thinking, particular kind of knowledge. And you should never think that that knowledge can be so helpful to you that you can manage yourself. Now, if that knowledge is not so helpful to you, if that knowledge is not in a way liberative knowledge, then what would you do? Then you need to reclaim your own epistemic frames. And how do you do that? You have to go back to your own culture. You have to talk of the authenticity of the culture. You have to examine the culture. You have to, you have to start engaging with your own knowledge system. You have to engage with your own cultural patterns. And maybe there are a lot of interesting things there. Maybe there is knowledge intertwined with that. You never know. Because after all, human beings are reflexing beings. After all, they have evolved while thinking about their ecology. They have developed their own theories. So, we have to reclaim them. While reclaiming them, of course, the issue of identity comes forward. We have to identify ourselves. We have to understand that who we are, how have we thought, what is our knowledge system, what is our culture and why did we think like that? What if we continue thinking like that? What will happen to us? Now, these are the issues that I think they are raising and these are very, very valid issues that they are raising. Raising, but I have a problem with this issue. I mean, to to great extent, I would I would agree with certain points that they have made. Not that I would reject all the points. I think that there is a dominant way of thinking propagated by the West about these societies, and there is a section of our society which is taking that as authentic knowledge about ourselves and trying to think only in that mode and therefore considering everything is backward, every knowledge is not knowledge, 
In fact, certain knowledge systems are also being criminalized. I do agree with that, that these kind of things have happened. I also do agree that these categories that we are using have to be re-examined, have to be rethought. There is a the possibility that these categories are unable to capture our own reality. But then having said that, I would like to move on to something else. I would like to suggest that. The first thing I want to suggest is that let us let us understand India or any other country for that matter by getting involved with the, the people, by engaging with the people. I think many of our scholars who are talking about this orientalism and all, they are located in the West and their location has given them very limited access to the depth of these societies, very limited access to the internal logic of the society and what they have encountered in the name of Indian society, in the name of these societies, post-colonial societies, I think they have only encountered the elites of these societies, the brown sides of these societies, those who are educated in the western idioms, those who are educated in the modern university systems, which is oriented towards the west. So we have mainly engaged with them, they are mainly engaged with them. And that is why they think that the colonial masters thought pattern has been copied by these people and we start making sense of ourselves only by that. I think it is doubtful. I would like to propose that let us look at the, the, the way people are thinking in the country. I think that if you, if you look at India carefully, you will find in the depth consciousness of the society, there are many, many traditional philosophies still existing and they are living their life only with the, with the help of traditional philosophies. They are not living their life with the help of so called either orientalist or occidentalist understanding. There are smaller communities, bigger communities all over the country in different parts of the country, particularly in the peripheries they are still thinking of themselves as if they were existing in a kind of isolated space. Even if those who are modern educated, those who are visibly totally influenced by what you call the orientalist perspective, if you go deep into them, Many of them you will discover that they are carrying their traditional understanding and I do not think it is traditional in the sense that there is a modernity and tradition historical evolution. I think tradition in the sense that alternative way of thinking, alternative no, even alternative is not a very good word because it's, it is alternative to something. I think this is another way of being, this is one of the ways of being. And there are many ways of being in a society and we are living with these many ways and simultaneously we are living with these many ways. And we do not think at times that our ways of being are bad. Yes, in the post colonial society we are provided with this polity and the economy in a way that if we keep existing with that particular kind of philosophy probably the economy will not approve of our existence probably the polity will not approve, approve of our existence. So, we make adjustments. Of course, there is a conflict in their mind because of that adju adju adjustment, but yet I think it is not impossible to see that these people are making sense of themselves under the broader context of their own collective consciousness. I take two examples before I finish. I did some field work in the Nyaya philosophy area. Nyaya was one of the major philosophies in India and there are parts of Bihar where this philosophy flourished. And to my surprise I discovered 
that despite decline of the system, decline in the sense that earlier there were around 1500 dioics in the in that area and they had schools in their homes, they used to run training process in their homes. There are hardly few left. There is no major attraction towards Nyayada anymore in the in that area, in that village, in the villages of that area. But yet, even the younger people, if you carefully analyze, you will discover that they have the same kind of understanding. They carry that framework of thinking. Some of them are into conflict between the modern and the, their own way of being and thinking, but yet I think that remains quite dominant. Let me mention a couple of names in this context. Even if they have become big elites and located in the west, even then they carry this as their, as their philosophical context. For example, take Amartya Sen's book Argumentative Indian. This book is all about that. That how his location, his, his, his earlier location in that particular area, his taking birth in a particular con collective consciousness influenced his thinking about economics even. Or I mentioned, I, I spoke to Kaviraj, Professor Sudipto Kaviraj, who is located in Colombia. Now, since last 20, 25 years, he is there. And I asked him, do you think you were born in that area and you are carrying that frame as yet? And he, he accepted that. Yes, it seems that that frame is still in my mind. And a lot of people tell him now there that you argue like an AI. So, this is something that we have to understand. I take another, another example. I had some, I did some field work in Assam and particularly in Mayong. Mayong is a, is a area in Assam. Uh, space, a village in Assam, which is known for a seed of tantric learning. It seems that sometime in 9th century, this was the area where people from all over the world, including particularly the Central Asia people, also used to come there and stay there and practice the tantric learning. Sufis used to come there. The tantrics from different parts of the country used to go there and that is known as in the collective consciousness as an area of tantric learning. Even if today if you go to Assam and ask people that if you want to go to that area, they will tell you do not go alone, there are a lot of tantrics there. Assam itself, look at the Assam itself, despite the modern training and everything you will discover that they have this understanding that they belong to that particular kind of frame of thinking. They will keep talking about tantra, mantra and lot of things, lot of them will talk about that. And tantra, mantra is a way of being, is a thin philosophy, is part of a larger philosophical context. Now, the problem with the modernity has been, the problem with the European knowledge system has been that and the colonial power has been that colonial colonial uh, colonial perspective or the, the orientalist thinking has demonized these things. They are considered to be part of the part of the uncivilized culture and we also started thinking about Tantra and Mayong and places like that in the same way. I think that is where the problem lies. When I am saying we started thinking, I mean to say the, the intellectual elites of the country. But if you go to the people, if you talk to them, I do not think they have any problem of this kind. And therefore, there is a conflict between the administration and the local people at times because there is a conceptual difference. So, I think what post colonial theorists are saying that is partially correct, but not completely correct. If they want to have a correct picture of the scenario, there is a need to engage with 
depths of deeper layers of society. And then we can understand how in the post-colonial society the thinking is going, a new thinking is emerging. Then only we will be able to capture the struggle that we are engaged in at the intellectual level. It is not simplistic struggle. I think at this moment we need to go beyond the east west paradigm and beyond the modernity, modernity tradition paradigm and engage with the knowledge traditions in a very democratic way. And that is the perspective that is emerging in the deeper layers of India. They are not interested whether it comes from east or from west. The issue is that for our survival we have to engage with different knowledge traditions and therefore, you will suddenly find that number of people even today going to tantrics in in place like Guwahati has not gone down. Very interestingly when Ramdev Ramdev's factory was raided and people said that he mixes human bone and something something lot of people made this comment that we are not bothered about what does it mix we are bothered about whether it cures us or not. So, I think at this moment Indian society is a creative society is trying to engage with all traditions and it has come out from that whole idea of colonial colonial subject. I am talking of the people at the deeper layer not the Indian elites. I think the Indian elites the intellectual elites of India have lost touch with the people and definitely those who are talking of post coloniality they have to prove their connectivity with the popular consciousness with the consciousness of the people. I think things are changing and they have changed and they have actually never changed the way they thought that has changed. So, all these things are happening I think it is a much more complex situation than it is generally taken. I would end here by saying that that we have to keep ourselves open to all the formulations being provided to us by the orientalists or the anti orientalists, but we have to be very careful that we should not start thinking of ourselves the way other people are conceptualizing us. We have to keep asserting that we have our own ways of thinking of ourselves, but we do not ignore the others way of thinking of ourselves. If we put them together then only we can know the truth and this is the point being made by a very famous Japanese philosopher called Kozin Karatani in his book called Trans Critique. It is very important to hold our ground that the way out we are thinking ourselves of ourselves, but it is also important to see how others are thinking of ourselves and neither we should fix ourselves with one or the other perspective. In fact, we should engage with them in a dialogue, we should bridge the gap, we should see what is the truth in both of them and move ahead and look for new philosophies, look for new ways of looking at things. I will end here. Thank you. Okay, that is true, but as you said that uh, the intelligentsia or the um, pers thinking personal academicians they have lost touch with the uh, reality or the lower state of the people or the uh, general masses. So, then to who will take lead and uh, try to establish such uh, knowledge or you can say the um, uh, wisdom which uh, uh, already exist in the Indian sense. I think they have th this has to be scholars, they have to be intellectuals, but also that we have to we have to end the hierarchical relationship between intellectuals. I think intellectuals should not think of themselves too superior than the common human beings and let them consider themselves as common thinking beings and also others very important. Then only probably a, a new kind of dialogue will start in society where you will have much more creative way of thinking. At the moment what is happening is look at the controversies going on. A lot of people would say something and suggest that common people are not understanding that and this only shows that either if what you want to say you have no idea how it will be received by the common people or you want to say something else actually. So, I think that the intellectuals will have to engage with 
the popular at the popular level with the people and see how are they thinking and then theorize that if you keep theorizing sitting in the metropolitan cities and in the western universities and then we always engage with our peer group and we seek recognition with the peer group from the peer group i think we will not be able to understand the reality of the contemporary times okay. so um, uh, theory making theory is in fact a set of uh, we can understand set of hypotheses hypothesis is a set of proposition and then set of a statement is a proposition so when we find the go deeper into the indian society we find a number of statement people pass yeah that they are very clear cut on any things whatever the issue you raise um, uh, and they will answer in one sentence this is the way so that you think that a deeper concerns as you said that there are uh, solution exist in the deeper concerns they don't uh, go for the options or alternative what they have available but rather they it's inbuilt yeah, you can say that inside the consciousness that they, this will be the right solution and many of the times they prove true even in case of say, in the modern science like uh, forecasting weather and all that uh, looking at the uh, con uh, general condition a farmer will tell you what is going to happen in next 2 or three, uh, 3 days and accordingly they plan that's right that is their experiential knowledge that is their experiential knowledge but then also you have to remember that they have a way of saying things if you ask somebody in india what is what is the truth they will give you the final statement and you have to be conscious of the ways of saying let me give you an example somebody asked me a friend of mine from england that do you keep a family i said no i have a family i don't don't have this option of keeping a family these are two cultural statements you know from two different things similarly somebody was giving this example if you asked if you go visit a family in india or in china in asian countries actually and you meet a child in the family and you say that well oh it's such a nice boy very smart very intelligent looks intelligent all all that what is the gut reaction of the mother the mother will say oh my god don't tell me this boy is absolutely bogus he is so naughty he never listens to me he becomes very simple when somebody comes from outside but the moment he is alone he creates all kinds of problems he doesn't study this this friend of mine said that well when i visited these families for the first time i discovered these kind of statements he was an american he said that i thought that probably india will have a generation of students young children with low self esteem but that is not uh, true then he discovered that no no this is the way they talk about it so there are ways of talking about that i don't think when we we say something about something in a confirmed way we actually mean that but this is a way of talking but also this is true that the knowledge that has been generated by the experiences at the ground level without any scientific instrumentation by observing the nature by observing things they have tremendous strength and there are many other ways of arriving on knowledge except the experimentation way and that's what that's what i want to argue about tantric tantric philosophy you know the way they conceive of mind and body and then develop certain kind of techniques of handling the body and the mind i think these are the knowledge systems these are the techniques the modern science can, doesn't consider that as technique but people in india do consider that as good techniques and important things and therefore they keep visiting these people and there are there are problems there also i accept it but i'm saying that at the deep in the deep deeper layers of society we are not still guided by what you call the orientalism if we have a scale can we say that information then knowledge then wisdom so we find the indian system and then people are more rooted in the wisdom than the knowledge and academics talk about the knowledge only and they they are not incorporating the what the wisdom exists already in the society in the mindset of the people that's true you know knowledge itself is a, is a is a kind of a power relationship why do you need knowledge and when do you think that you are more knowable knowledgeable the moment you say something is knowledge 
it means you are claiming superiority. Now, in many of the non-Western societies, you will find that knowledge and wisdoms are intertwined. They are living together. They are existing together. So, they do not call that knowledge. Where there the intentionality is very important. But in the modern society, they separated this knowledge and made the knowledge hubs, made the knowledge centers and the knowledge centers became powerful centers after some time. And that is what Foucault suggests that how knowledge became power. So, knowledge of the body, knowledge of the body that doctor acquires gives them power and that constitutes a very hierarchical society if you if you read Foucault's arguments on this. It is very interesting that how the modern doctors, how the clinic itself is a site of power relationship. You will see in India also many well educated rich persons also visiting a doctor will actually fear and doctors create such kind of situations. Even in the knowledge production centers between the professors and the students in many of the areas you will find the fear factor works. They work through the fear and because knowledge itself has that kind of notion of fear. The knowledge has this that kind of notion of power. I think that is not very common okay, in the societies. I like to ask you. Then where are we moving ahead from here? No, I think that it is a very positive situation. I think it is a very positive situation that we are, we are a creative society. We have now come out from that understanding that our, our, uh, our knowledge was inferior. Mm -hmm. I think that people have started thinking that we had knowledge system okay. and now they are also out from that identity politics of the knowledge and they think that the knowledge has its own limitation and we need to improve that further. So, they are working on these things. Okay. So, well friends, it is certainly we are moving in a positive direction. So, with this board we conclude the lecture. I thank all of you for watching the lecture and on your behalf I thank Dr. Raymond Thakur for giving such an insightful lecture on this very topic. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.